beautiful day to worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. So when I'm broken at my weakest, in my darkest hour, I let my worship be a weapon on this battleground. From the depths of the lowest place, I will give you the highest praise, the highest praise. So when I'm broken, at my weakest, in my darkest hour, I'll let my worship be your weapon on this battleground. From the depths of the lowest place, I will give you the highest praise, the highest praise. I am hanging on to every word you speak. I can see beyond to the victory. Lord, you never live. Lord, you never change. All my confidence in Jesus' name. The cross put the enemy to shame, and now my soul echoes through an empty grave. Because the cross put the enemy to shame, and now my soul echoes through an empty. Grave. Oh, let it rise because the cross put the enemy to shame and now my soul echoes through an empty grave because the cross put the enemy to shame and now my soul echoes through an empty grave so when I'm broken at my weakest in my darkest hour, I let my worship be your weapon on this battleground. From the depths of the lowest place, I will give you the highest praise, the highest praise. And I will give you the highest praise, the highest praise. Because the cross and now my soul echoes through an empty grave because the cross put the enemy to shame and now my soul echoes through an empty grave so when I'm broken and my weakest in my dark I let my worship be your weapon on this battleground. From the depths of the lowest place, I will give you the highest praise, the highest praise. So when I'm broken at my weakest in my darkest hour, I let my worship be your weapon on this battleground from the depths of the lowest place I will give you the highest praise, the highest praise because the cross put the enemy to 
shade And now my soul Yeah, cause through an empty grave Because the cross Put the enemy to shame And now my soul Echoes through an empty grave Because the cross Put the enemy to shame And now my soul of the lowest place I will give you the highest praise the highest praise I will give you the highest praise the highest praise I will give you the highest praise the highest praise I will give you the highest praise It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saying the It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same the Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust.
And I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee. Precious Jesus, Savior and friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust. Trust him
experience that today are you walking close with him are you calling on him Christian or sinner are we calling on him we call on him as a sinner to repent but as Christians we call on him because he's right he gives us everything now sometimes he corrects us and it's not fun it's not fun scripture even tells us that it's not fun but it's necessary necessary to help us keep us walking that straight path the presence of the Lord is here this morning I know that you feel him and that's our reason for being here to worship him to worship the Lord I thought about it coming in this morning corporately and it's good to be with each one of you but corporately, we only get together like this four, maybe five times a month in this setting here. That's not very much when you consider 30 or 31 days in a month. I mean, I know we're, we're busy with other things. This is not the only opportunity we have. We have Bethesda offers lots of areas to gather. But in this setting right here where we all get to be together, and encourage one another only four times a month. That's very little. Very little out of a whole month. I'm like, wow. I, I would like this every day. So as we continue to worship the Lord this morning, we're going to receive the tithes and the offerings and the alms. Uh, thank the Lord this morning for His goodness. As you put your offering in, thank Him for provisions He's made and is making and the life that he's given you it's good amen it's good better than wandering lost in the world it's it's so much better so much better than wandering around out there not knowing what's what what direction to go trying to just take care of everything yourself so tough father we love you this morning we love your word we love your word, God, that directs our footsteps, that encourages us, that, that brings us health and strength. And God, we just honor you this morning as, God, as we bring in offerings, tithes, Lord, let these offerings be acceptable in your sight, oh God. And God, we know when we give, we give to the kingdom of God. We're not giving to the church. We're not giving to the pastor. We're not giving to the Sunday school class or children's ministry, but it's giving to you, God. And just like you fed the, the 5,000 with the fish and the loaves, you can multiply this offering that there will be lots and lots gathered that can go out and touch lives. That, Lord, it will touch somebody that doesn't know you as we try to get the good news out into the world around us and share that. That is so precious to be able to share that with others that they might know you, God. And you can, you can give them life. Father, we pray your blessings in Jesus' name. Praise God. Can you sense his presence today? One person? Good. We got one. Amen. Can we sense his presence today? So we've got some wonderful announcements for you guys. Um, <clears throat> these are all very special things that Bethesda offers that are important to us. It's important for our spiritual growth. It's important for um, maturity. We have a tabernacle seminar coming. It's going to be Friday, May 5th, starting this Friday that's coming, and May 6th. So Friday and Saturday, Jason King will be here to present this class to us, this course. Uh, it's $55.
That includes your lunch on Saturday. So Friday, it starts at 6.30 and ends at 9. Saturday, it is 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Lunch is provided. $55 for your spiritual growth to continue to grow, to continue to process, to continue to mature. And the way that I look at some of this stuff, I looked at it and I thought, man, when I take my family out after church to any restaurant, I don't care where we go, it's always over $55. So I look at it like this. If, if we can fast one meal, one going out to eat somewhere, coffee, whatever it is that, that costs you, and you look at that, that's a, that's a great fast and sacrifice for this seminar. So I want to encourage you to come to that this Friday, this Saturday. Jason King, he is gifted, super gifted. This guy will, will bring you the truth. Uh, it is a fresh word every time he comes and teaches. He is incredible. Uh, I love Jason King, and I am excited for him to be here. <clears throat> so for $55, you can come and experience and get blessed and grow and mature in the Lord. And so the second thing is, guys, is we have camp coming up for our kids. Yeah. My kids have been a product of the camp for many, many years, from my oldest son to my youngest. They have been blessed. They have been baptized. They have been prayed for. They have been everything you can imagine at a church camp. They have been blessed. Uh, I, have, I have a vision for this church to one day where parents don't have to pay to send their kids. I was a youth pastor for many years. My wife, we were youth pastors, and we would fight. We would fight to raise money to send our kids. We didn't come from a church with a lot of money, but we came from a church that had a lot of kids. And so when you're trying to send 30, 40 kids to camp, and, and Kayla was in that youth group, she was a part of it. She knows. She was out on the one red light in town selling Krispy Kreme donuts. We're chasing cars down. Completely illegal. We didn't know that until afterwards. But we did. We went door to door. We had a van. We dropped kids off in the neighborhood door to door. But, you know, God always provides where there's ministry at work. Uh, Pastor Scott Gillum told me that one time because of what we did. He said, money follows ministry. And I believe Bethesda is blessed because Bethesda is doing the will and the work of God. And in the end. I, I believe, Sean, Michaela, the youth pastors here, and the, and the youth team, I, I feel like this summer that Bethesda and its people, if you don't have kids going to camp, that's all right. You can send one to camp. Yeah. Because I know when my kids are done with camp, I've got one kid that aged out many years ago. I've got one that's aging out this year. And then Kyle's going to have one year left after this year. But I'm going to pay their camp fees every year for somebody else. That's what God has put on my heart. And so I'm praying that God puts it on your heart. And one of the cool things that uh, Bethesda does, I know that <clears throat> we sometimes think, man, I missed, I missed it. I couldn't give my offering or I didn't have my cash or I forgot my checkbook. Uh, we can go to the website and we can give online. It's www.bethesdaky.com. And there will be a place on there that you can give. So if you're today here and you, and you weren't able to give, uh, you can go online and do it. Which brings me to today. I'm boosting the children's ministry fundraiser lunch. Uh, yeah. And we do a VBS, but it's not actual VBS. It's called Adventure Kids. And it's going to be in July 16th to the 20th. And they asked me, hey, can you boost that offering? I'm like, yeah, what do you want me to do? They said, boost the offering. I said, all right, what are we going for? Just boost it. Do whatever you do. And I'm like, all right. So I prayed about it. And I said, Lord, what, do, what am I to say? What am I to do? Here's what we need, guys. This is what our Adventure Kids does. We have the best children's coordinator in the state. Yeah. Hands down. Yeah. Amen. Her family has been a blessing. I wish we had more volunteers to teach and train our children in our classrooms. It's the most underrated position in the church, but it's the most fulfilling when you see a child confess Jesus as Lord, when they share their hearts, when they tell on their parents. That's my favorite part. But in the end, 
God is using the teachers and the kids that come from this. I point to that side because that's where our classroom is at. But Rachel, hands down, is called by God to do this children's ministry. I have never seen anybody that puts more time, more effort into a ministry than her. It's more passionate. She is incredible. And I said, Heather, or not Heather, because I was going to use Heather in a minute. I said, Rachel, what do you need for your VBS? What do you need for Adventure Kids? What do you need? I said, how much money do you need? She said it costs about $2,500 to put on this program. If you have not been in this program or been a part of this program or been around it, it will blow you away. It takes time. The hours that the team will put in, <clears throat> if it was a production in Hollywood or something, uh, they deserve a lot because it would cost a ton of money to do something like they, we do here at Bethesda. When I say we, I mean Rachel and the team and the youth and everybody that's invested. It is worth every bit of that. So here's, here's what today's youth or children's ministry fundraiser is for. It is for the money to go towards VBS, Adventure Kids. There's not a better investment. I could go on about this, but I want you to pray about it. I'm going to pray. Uh, when you go today, enjoy it. If you don't have money, it's free. It's on the house. No big deal. No biggie. If you didn't bring any money, no problem. Get in line and go eat. That's what it's all about. But if you leave here today, www.bethesdaky.com, and you get home and you're like, man, I really want to give to those kids. You can go online and give. And I just want to stress that with you guys, that the greatest investment that I see is in the future of the children. We were blessed with our evangelist that came with Tim. We had kids getting filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in different tongues. Are we not excited about that? Are we not excited? They all start wearing diapers in here. And then they go to preschool. And then they go to elementary. And then they go to youth. We have a limited time to invest in our children. It is limited. So I'm asking for $2,500 before July. That's what I'm, I'm putting that out. That's what we need to do. That's what we're going to do. The Lord, the Lord will bless that. So, Father, we just thank you for this day, this time, this opportunity to come together and, and worship corporately. But, Lord, we lift up Bethesda and the seminars that we put on to spiritually grow and mature. Lord, I lift up our youth and our children's ministry today that you know the significance and the important it is that we invest and we pour our time and our finances into these young people, God. We just give you praise, and I believe today, God, that you're going to provide every financial need that is needed for these young kids to go to camp and to have VBS. I believe it wholeheartedly, God, that you are going to provide more than what was asked today. So we just give you praise and claim it in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, everybody rise to your feet. I was excited, man. I'm, I'm ready to see what God's going to do. So let's meet in greet time. Let's walk around, shake each other's hands, say hi, hello. Let's make it happen.
that's how you know who we are. Uh, so, as always, uh, for Richard, wherever he's at, the uh, next slide. We have to go through, because Richard's one of them guys that they, he jumps to the end of the book. So he has to know what the ending is, and he goes back and reads the rest of the book. So he has to know the book. So for that, I'll cover, this is what we're going to cover today. So today, first thing we're going to do is experience an example of missing the big picture. Now, that's a very long phrase for saying we're going to play a game. Okay? All right. Not yet. Go back. Hold on a second. <laughs> Second, we're going to have a question of the day, but have no fear. We will give you the answer long before we ask the question, if I remember the flow of the diagrams. So, so, you will, so that you don't have to worry about it. Now, in school, we would do stuff like, like when I taught the college, we would go, if we had a, you know, the answer is kind of up, we'd stomp our feet or something. Well, I'm not going to do that because that kind of throws stuff off. But you will know very clearly the answer. And then I'll give you the answer. So even if you, get, you answered wrong, you'll have the right answer when you leave. Right? Can't beat that. Okay, the next thing we'll do after that, we're going to talk about expanding our territory by establishing colonies. And then we're going to talk, do a little demo on uh, how small changes can make big differences. Okay? So it's four easy things that'll go quick, won't last more than seven, eight hours, and so we'll all be good. Okay, next slide. Now you can go. Okay. So now comes the game side. So they're going to show, I think it's six pictures, um, that uh, you have to guess what they are, but you have to do it silently to yourself. This is not a group effort. And so you'll do it, and you'll get through it, and then we'll, all those little pieces come together and make something big, if you get all the pieces right, and then you'll, we'll tell you what that is, Okay. So, but you only get to look at them for about four seconds. So they're going to go down the show the pictures for about four seconds. I don't know why I did that. There we go. Begin. So you'll kind of, you got like four seconds to figure out what that is. Next. One, two, four. Click. Click. That's a long four seconds. Try and try again. This is kind of a giveaway. Okay, so go back to the top. Don't show the bottom picture yet. There we go. Okay, there. So does anybody know what this is? Where you do open it up? Well, raise your raise your hand with not out saying it if you know what that is. Oh, we got a pretty good crowd on that. Next one. How many knew it was the first time it came through though? Oh, well, about half them. Good, good. And how many know what that is? Okay, and then the next one. Let's get a little next. There we go. All right, next one. Okay, good. Next one. And that one, of course, that's the easy one. And then, of course, the answer is it is a elephant. elephant. Next slide. There we go. Very good, very good. Give yourselves a hand. Got that right. Okay. And, and so the point there is there's actually a poem out uh, a long time ago about uh, six blind men who came up on an elephant. And uh, one of them came up and they, he grabbed the tail of the elephant, which was one of the examples, and he grabbed the tail and he said, oh, the, an elephant is much like a rope. And then another one went over and he touched the side of the elephant and he said, which is broad, and he said, oh, the elephant is much like a wall. Another one went and he touched the ear of the elephant. He said, it's much like a fan. An elephant is like a fan. Uh, another one touched the tusk, and he said, oh, it's like a spear. Another one touched the trunk, and it said, it's like a snake, right? And so each one of them was right in their own perspective. In the little piece that they knew, they were right. And, and the thing was, they actually, as if you read the rest of the poem, they actually got to the point where they would begin to argue with each other about what was truth, what was right. The one that touched the, the side said, oh no, it, it's not a bit like a rope. The one that touched the tail said, oh no, it's not, it's not a bit like a wall. The other one touched the leg said, oh no, it's not like a tree at all. You know, and, or it's like a tree. And so the, the, the moral, I guess, behind that story is sometimes we get caught looking at the little pieces 
and we miss the overall picture. And so sometimes that doesn't just happen when we talk about animals like elephants. Sometimes it actually happens within uh, the spiritual world. And so today what I'd like to do is kind of talk through something and hopefully along the way uh, we can illustrate, we'll see that sometimes we get involved in looking at the little pieces and we really missed out on what's important, the big thing. And so with that, uh, it started with my journey down this path. Next slide. One day I was reading Mark uh, 3, I think it says 13 through 15 there, whatever it is. And uh, it says, this is what it says, I thought it was really interesting. It said, and he went up, talking about Jesus, to the mountain, and he called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. So he's talking about who? Who came to him? The disciples, right? Twelve disciples. And they came to him, and he appointed twelve, and so twelve disciples, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. And I kind of blitzed over that, like I always do, because you know, we know that's what he does, right? But then I was reading this, like the Lord thumped me in the head, and he said, well, what, what did he have him preach? Now, of course, what my, my response is, it's the good news, right? That Jesus died on the cross, that he rose on the third day, that uh, he's alive again, he's up with the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit, blah, 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 right? The problem is, that's, that's in Mark 3. Jesus doesn't die till like the 15th or 16th chapter. Wait a minute. I was like, wait a minute, that can't be right. He can't be sending them out to preach the good news because the new good, good news hasn't happened yet. Right? Well, I was wrong. Oh, my goodness. I was wrong. There was good news. In fact, it, it ties into where I was seeing little pieces and I really wasn't seeing the big picture. Because as we read through that, it says that he sent them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and cast, over the de- cast out demons. And so, luck- so it goes to the next question, right? Click. So what gospel or good news, because that's what gospel means is good news, did Jesus have the disciples preach? He's not dead. He's not risen. He's not ascended. What's he having them preach? Well, as Chancellor would always say, the, if, you ha- if you have a question, the answer is always in the book. It's always in the book. And so luckily for us, they have four Gospels of which they retell the stories from a different perspective. And if we jump over to, I believe it's Luke, he actually says he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Same story. But he actually outlines a little bit what he's actually teaching them to, to uh, preach. And I thought, well, that's odd. Because typically when we think of kingdom of God, it's typically for us, it's just something that, no offense, we're saying it's just something that's out there. You know, we're working for the kingdom. What does that mean? No, when we ask, nobody knows. And so anyway, next slide. I thought, well, that's interesting, the kingdom of God. Next slide. And then it's, I actually turned to where Jesus begins his ministry. So here you have Jesus, right? He's beginning his ministry. He's just come out of the wilderness. He's just, uh, he's been through the 40 days of fasting, the temptation by the devil. He's full of the Holy Ghost, right? And it says, now after John was put in prison... Jesus came to Galilee preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Which means, in Old English, that actually means it's here, it's now. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe in what? The gospel. What's the gospel here? That the kingdom of God is here. Not that I'm dead and I'm raised up from the dead and I've ascended. Because that ain't happened yet. He's just starting. And, and, and as I begin to get through it there, it's, 
it's this thing about the gospel of the kingdom of God. Next slide. And so I, I did the old, uh, how many times is it in there, right? Well, actually it says in Matthew there, it says that he tells us to, uh, this is where he's talking to disciples and they're talking about the raiment they wear. He says, don't worry about your clothes. Don't b- worry about the food you eat. Don't worry about those things, right? But instead, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God. Not just salvation, not just you getting to heaven, but I want you to seek the kingdom of God. And then he goes on, he says, later on he says, when he's casting out devils, he says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come. And then he goes on and Matthew says, again, I say to you, it's easier for a man to get to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven? No. To enter what? The kingdom of God. I know this is a little shift, right? Next slide. And then it goes on. Next slide. Click. Hopefully it'll click. There we go. Which, he's telling this story, and he says, which of the two of the, did the will of his father? And they said to him, the first, Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say unto you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. And then he goes on and says, therefore, I say to you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation Bearing the fruits of it. This is where he's talking to Israel. Next slide. It says, but the Lord said to them, I must preach, this is Jesus speaking, the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. Well, wait a minute. I've, I've, I've always been taught that the purpose he came was to do what? To die on a cross. That's not what he said. Well, one of those is truth and one of those is not true. Maybe what I've been taught hasn't been true. Now, it's a piece. It's the tail of the elephant, maybe, or the leg or the tusk. And I've taken it and I've held it. Actually, we have, there are whole organizations that are about nothing about except about Jesus dying. There are whole organizations that their whole thrust is baptism. There are whole organizations who their whole thrust is the Holy Spirit. There are whole organizations who their whole thrust is some other piece of the Bible. Some act that Jesus did. It's a foot. It's an ear. It's a tusk. It's a side. It's a tail. And they'll fight you for it. Just like those blind men did the elephant. They'll holler at you, they'll scream at you, they'll stand on the, foot cor- the corners of the street and scream at each other, and yet they're missing the big picture. That he came to preach the kingdom of God. Because it expands other things. When we go on, it says, how many women uh, tried to minister to Jesus, now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city, city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of Of what? The kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. Next slide. And he said, to you it has been given to know, this is where he's talking to the disciples, the mysteries of salvation, the mysteries of my burial, the mysteries of my, no, the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And he goes, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God. This is also in Luke. Uh, And then we go down to the bottom of Luke. says, but I tell you truly there are some standing who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Next slide. Jesus said to them, let the dead. This is where the, he teaches the parable. And he's saying, uh, one guy says, I got land and I, I got to go bury. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have land. Somebody's passed away and I got to go bury him. And Jesus says to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach what? Because that's where we end it. I've heard that story a hundred thousand times. And they always cut the, the, the verse off at, go and preach, right? Or go. They never tell you what you're supposed to preach. What's well, the kingdom of God? And then in that same parable, he says, But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost, 
become a member of the great church of God? No. He doesn't state any of that. He says they're not fit for the kingdom of God. In fact, he says that when you go to a place and if they reject you, you're to du- knock the dust off your feet, right? So that they know that the kingdom of God was near them and they ignored it. Next slide. And then he talks about in the parable of the leaven. And again he said, he starts off with, what shall I liken to salvation? No. Judaism? No. Mormonism? No. What shall? Because he's trying to convey a thought to these people. What shall I liken to the kingdom of God? And he goes on, he says, There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves are thrust out. And then he says, They'll come from the north, the, I'm sorry, I, that's what I said, from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down where? In, in your church house? No. They'll sit down in the kingdom of God. Next slide. And then it's another parable of the Great Supper. says, Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And the law and the prophets were until John. So the Old Testament, as we call it, was preached until John the Baptist. But then John came preaching what? The gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God is now here. Jesus, he actually said it's on its way. Jesus says it's now here. And everyone is pressing into it. Okay, next slide. And then he says, but seek first again the kingdom of God and all these things should be added. We even know the parable of the mustard seeds. And he says, what is the kingdom of God like? Not, how is the how, what is the, the uh, religion of Christianity like? What is the religion of Islam like? What is the religion of Judaism like? Because Jesus don't care about those. Jesus came to establish a kingdom. That's why he's trying to convey, how can I express to you what the kingdom of God is like? Oh, it's like a mustard seed. Okay. It says, Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Next slide. But Jesus called to him and said, Let the little children come to me and don't forbid them. And usually that's where we stop. Right? How many times have you heard that story? Let me stop. But the actual rest of that verse says, For of such is... The kingdom of God. And because with God all things are possible. And when Jesus saw that they had become very sorrowful, he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Next slide. And this is actually from Paul. And you say, Well, okay, Jesus came, he talked about the kingdom of God. That was all before he died, before he was uh, resurrected, before he ascended, right? Before the Holy Ghost fell. After that, the good news changed. And they preached that. They preached those. Well, the thing is, this is from Paul, where he's getting ready to go and uh, to Rome. He's getting ready to be, it's the last time the, Asia, the people in the churches in Asia will see him. And he, this is what he says. He says, and indeed, now, that I, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching, The kingdom of God will see my face no more. Even Paul, after all those things, because he realized he did preach about salvation, he did preach about uh, the resurrection, he did preach who Jesus was, but he knew that all those were pieces 
that fit into the bigger picture of the kingdom of God. But if we were to ask this question, how often in the last hundred years, which nobody here is a hundred, right? But over your lifespan, that you've attended church, has anybody really talked about the kingdom of God? No, we have lots of things going on where we want to get people saved or get them sanctified, fill the Holy Ghost. But we really don't see where all that, that hits. And it's kind of like to me where, for example, I've got these papers and each one of them has something on them, and I, but I don't have anything to hang them on. And so we, like on one Sunday we come and we talk about salvation, another Sunday we come and talk about the Holy Ghost, another we talk about what He does, and it's over here, and people leave and they have a peace, and they may, something, the Lord may speak to them about uh, the Holy Ghost, and that may be the trunk, and they're like, oh... This is it. I got it. I got it. And they'll fight you for that, and they'll defend you for that, and they'll talk to you about that. But it's only a piece. It's only a piece. Next slide. Click. Okay, which leads us to, so we've covered all that, just so we could come to the question of the day. And the question of the day is, which religion... Did Jesus preach? Did he preach Judaism? Did he preach Islam? Did he preach Christianity? Did he preach all of the above? Or did he preach none of the above? Take, now, this is where you, you don't have to say it out loud, so take your little tablet, it's on the end of your arm there, there you go, and you write the letter, there you go, on your palm, for the answer that you think it is. Which religion did Jesus preach? Judaism, Islam, Christianity, all of the above, or none of the above? Everybody got that? All right, good. And the answer is, drum roll. Well, nobody's at the drums. Okay. <laughs> Where's he at when you need it? <laughs> Click. The answer is, brrr, E, none of the above. Jesus didn't come to preach any religion. I know it's a shocker because we're in a church. And what do you have in church? Typically, it should be religion. But he came to preach the kingdom. Okay, click. Next slide. And if you don't believe that, we go back to Isaiah. Okay? And, and we know this, this verse because we always say it at Christmas. This is a Christmas verse. We don't, we don't dig it out any other time. It's a Christmas verse, right? It, it's when we talk about Jesus being born. And, and usually it's in a play, and it's some little kid who'll mess it up, but they got angel wings on. We know the story, right? We know this. And they'll say, For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And then they stop, right? Because one, we don't want them to look bad. But at the same time, we stop the, the verse there. But that, the verse doesn't stop there. Isaiah didn't stop there. He says, And the government will be upon his shoulder. What that means is, he's coming with a government. And then he says, and his name shall be called, because we'll skip that part, and we'll say this next part, and that some other little kid with angel wings will say, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we'll all go, oh, that's so sweet. And we stop there. Right? I mean, right? In that Christmas place? Yeah, yeah. And we stop there. But it doesn't stop there. The next verse goes on to number seven. Click. And it says, Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Wow. Wow. Not only is it Jesus, right, that's doing it, but the Lord of hosts, who is that guy? That's like this guy, God the Father. He's going to make it happen, and he's excited about it. That means he's not bringing down religion either. He's bringing down a kingdom. Okay, next slide. 
And if you didn't believe that, then we go to when Jesus was, uh, Mary was pregnant with Jesus. There we go. And the angel appeared and said, then the angel said to her, do not be afraid for you have found favor with God. That's another Christmas thing, right? And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And we stop there, but it doesn't. Next slide. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God, that's the big guy we were talking about, will give him what? The throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his religion, no, no, of his Islamism, no, no, of his Christian, no, of his kingdom, there will be no end. That's right. And so it leads us to the next slide. So what is a kingdom? Because we really don't talk about it. Right? We look at the pieces and we see the parts. But how does that really tie together in a kingdom? Okay, so next slide. Okay, so what are some things that occur in a kingdom? Well, in a kingdom, a kingdom is not a democracy. It's not a republic. In a kingdom, the king does not come over and say, okay, you guys take a vote. And whatever you guys say, that's what we'll do. The king don't do that. He don't walk over to this side either and say, those guys, they don't know what you're talking about. I want you guys to take a vote. And whatever you say, we'll do. No. The king says, this is the way it is. And then your response as the, if it was on an earthly kingdom, it'd be a subject, but he doesn't treat us as subjects. We'll talk about that in a minute. He treats us as kings, ambassadors, right? He doesn't want subjects. And so, in that case, though, on the earthly kingdom, the subjects, he would say, this is the way it is, and that's the way you follow Actually, if we were to take it in the biblical terms, he, it would make it so that the way was straight and narrow. Because there is no deviance with a king's decree. There's actually a story that the Lord led me to a long time ago. And uh, I was debating on telling the story because I don't want to take too long. But I was at home and I was in bed. I'd just gone to bed. It was like 11 o'clock or something like that. And uh, the house we had in Bowling Green, the we had a garage that was attached, and there was a door that connected the garage to the house. That's why it was attached. And so you had to come through the, uh, the uh, utility room, and then because that's a mud room, and then there was the bedroom on the other side. Well, I'm laying there, and I hear... Uh, I'm like, what? There's somebody in my garage. And I'm like... So I listen again, and I said, how did somebody get in my garage? Because I know I shut the garage door, side door, it was closed. Maybe how, how is somebody knocking on my, the door that connects to the garage? So I go over, you know, and you, you pick up your Louisville slugger, right? You know, in case they're not friendly. And, uh, or whatever you have at the house. And you, uh, you go over and open the door, and there's nobody there. Nobody. So I went, I checked, all the garage doors were closed, all of them were locked, all the windows were locked. Checked under the car, checked in the car, you know, because I'm a little paranoid. I checked all those places, nobody there, nobody, nobody. I was like, that was odd. I know I heard it, so I shut the door, and as I'm sitting there, I kind of, it's, it's like it's playing back in my mind, and it's like this word comes to mind called Zerubbabel. And I was like, Zerubbabel? I've never heard that. Is that, is that supposed to be... Beelzebub? No, that's the devil. You know, Zerubbabel. What is Zerubbabel? I don't even know what that is. But it sounds like a biblical word. And so uh, I did anything that you would do at midnight. I called my dad, woke him up, and had him look it up. Because he, uh, he had the electronic version. I just had the books. And so it turns out it's in Ezra, actually. And it's the story of uh, where I believe it was Darius had told the children of Israel were leaving Babylon and they were going back and they were going to build uh, 
to the wall of the temple. I think it was the temple. And uh, all these people who were around them uh, didn't like it. Actually, they were going to build a wall. And they said, if you build a wall, these people are rebellious. There's a new king. Uh, they're going to rebel against you. And so uh, they raised so much fuss that the new king, Darius had passed, said, hold the project until we find out something. And so it's like two years passed. They searched the king's house. They searched all the places of records. Finally, it was like two years later. You can read the story. If I say any of these details wrong, you can correct them. But they get to the summer palace, and in the summer palace they find the decree of the king. And the decree of Darius said that they could not only go, but that the state would support the funding. Now, Darius was dead. He wasn't king no more. But the thing about a kingdom is that the decree of a king, it lasts forever. It doesn't end. And so they went to those people, which is, I always find how God is so ironic and funny. They went to the guys who were whining in the court, and they said to them, well, looks like they get to build it. And I tell you what, you guys get to pay for it. That's just how God is, right? And so they did it, and they went ahead and built. And so the, the thing is, it goes on, and, and it led to the scripture in Ezra where it says that it's not by might, and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not whatever we do, it's whatever the king decrees. Whatever he said for your life, whatever he has said for your path, it will be accomplished. There is nothing that can stand in the way. Nothing. That's the difference between a kingdom and a religion. And so the other thing is that the king owns everything in the kingdom. Your clothes, your house, your whatever. Your roof has a leak. Whose fault is it? Who has to fix it? The king. That's why he said to the disciples, don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about the problems about tomorrow. What, 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 what are you doing? I am the king of glory. I will take care of it all. I will supply. Instead, all you need to seek first is the kingdom of God. And everything else, your clothes, your food, everything that you want is going to be added to you. That's why he said it. Because it is a kingdom. And then he goes on, the king's also responsible for the safety and welfare of the citizens of the kingdom. Because we fight not against what? Flesh and blood, and we are made of flesh and blood but against spiritual powers. So we cry out. Actually, even when we don't know how to cry out, the Holy Spirit cries out for us. To the Father, who is the King of Kings, uh, the, the ultimate King, right? Because the Son, who is the King of Kings, because we are kings, stands at the right-hand throne of the Father and makes what? Intercession for who? us and then when we appeal the almighty father then what happens it gets done it gets done okay the other is the king uh the king's thoughts desires and intent they constitute the constitution of the kingdom which means it's a way of saying that whatever he decrees is law and you can count on it so that when you go before him, it's not a case of, well, Lord, I just feel bad today. I'm awful. I'm going to cry a while. I want to do whatever. No, no, no. You take his word. You said, you said, right here, I shouldn't have to worry about my clothes. I don't have to worry about my food. We were home one day, I've told this story before, where my dad, you know, was laid off for like two years, and we didn't have any, the cupboards were bare. He had three kids. And uh, he was out chopping 
a log because he had nothing else to do. Guys, we just go out and chop logs because we got nothing else to do. And what happened? He's sitting there and he said, Lord, you, you know, I, I've done everything you said. You said the, the, you've never seen the righteous forsaken nor the seed begging bread. You said I don't have to worry about food. An hour later, a knock on the door. The town drunk who was sitting in his chair across town has three bags of groceries. He says, I was sitting in my chair and the Lord spoke to me and said, go get some groceries for that family. I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor the seed begging bread because my king rules. The kingdom is also an area that, or domain that's ruled by a king and they want to expand it. And so what you have is, that's actually how we get the word kingdom. The area that a king rules is called a domain. You take king and add domain and you get kingdom, right? King's domain. So because we're lazy, we like to shorten stuff. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is a picture. To give you an example, we're going to talk about, this is a natural picture. This is King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella and their king and queen of Spain. Does anybody know who they are? All right, he knows. So anybody else? Yeah, so who are they? Yes, they're the king and queen of Spain. <laughs> when were they the king and queen of Spain? Can somebody give me one year that they were king and queen of Spain? 1492, that's exactly right. And the little guy in the corner might be, I wasn't sure how to read the picture, might be a guy by the name of Christopher Columbus. And so King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella were the king of Spain, and they wanted, and, and Christopher Columbus, who was Genoese, he wasn't even from there, he comes to them and he says, I mean, we know the story, he says, I'm going to, I can, the world is round, and I can go this way and get to India and get a trade route and make you money. Because kingdoms want to expand, right? They want to create territory. They want those things. Because that's how they keep their people healthy and wealthy and wise, right? Okay. So, next slide. And so they sent out explorers, one of them which was Christopher Columbus. He's the one on the, your left. And another one just, I just threw in, his name was Ponce de Leon. Anybody know what he uh, so-called discovered, claimed? Huh? Florida. Florida, that's exactly right. And another was John Cabot. Anybody know what he was known for? It's like the north. He, he was, he, uh, I won't tell you where he was from because I want to ask that as a question. But uh, he did, uh, like, Hudson, like Hudson, I don't know if you know Hudson, John Hudson. He did Hudson Bay and all that. And so this guy also did the north part of the... Uh, Southern part of Canada and the U.S. Okay, so of those two, here's pop quiz. You didn't think he was going to have one. Here's pop quiz. So of those two, there's three up there. Two of them are from the same, they serve the same country. They're not from the same country, but they serve the same country. Which two, by looking at those pictures, can you say are from, serve the same king and queen? I'll give you 10 seconds, and you just not to be out loud. You can write it on your palm in just a second. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, write it on your palm. Which two you think serve the same king and queen? Write it on your palm. You're not writing it on your palm. Write it on your palm. There you go. Okay, so which two? Somebody give me an answer. Uh, Christopher and John Cabot? No, that's not right. Christopher and Ponce de Leon. How would we know that by looking at the picture if we didn't know anything else? The flags, that's right. Because the flag does not represent the explorer, the flag represents the king. And when they would go and collect, or uh, I would say collect, or establish a new kingdom, they would take the flag and plant the flag. And when they planted the flag, they would claim the land for the kingdom, and the kingdom would be here, wherever the flag was. 
Because if you look at their flags, it's a, it's a lion and a uh, castle, which, if you just throw this out as general trivia, is because uh, Ferdinand and Isabella were both, they were the first king and queen of Spain, the overall peninsula, but they had, before that, their forefathers owned two territories within Spain. One was called Castile and one was called Leon. Castile, if you change it to English, means castle, and Leon means lion. Therefore, their coat of arms was castles and lions. Okay, so uh, whereas John Cabot worked for the, uh, he worked for the Dutch and the English. That's why he did the North. Okay, next slide. Okay, but then it leads us to a question. I've done all this to lead to this question. But what if a king wasn't like Isabella, I mean Ferdinand and Isabella, what if that king and queen weren't like that? What if you had a king that had ultimate power? And he could not only search for new lands by sending out explorers, but instead he could create new lands, new colonies, or even new worlds. What would that look like? Next slide. It might look something like this. Next slide. In the beginning, this ultimate king would create the heavens and the earth. And the earth would be without form and void and darkness would be on the face of the deep. And the spirit of the, the ultimate king would hover over the face of the waters. And the ultimate king would say, let there be light. And because of who he was, there was light. Next slide. And then he might say, I'm, so I'm going to create this world, but at the same time, I'm not, I don't want to leave where I'm at. I'm, I'm going to uh, make a creature, a species, it's actually a species, that to rule over this world for me. And so he says, would say, then the ultimate king would say, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, so they would ha he would have our attributes. And let them have dominion. And that the Hebrew word there that the English translated to dominion actually means kingdom. Let them have a kingdom over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Wow. In the beginning. The, the neat thing there, I don't know if you've noticed, but what is missing from that, the things that they have dominion over? Men. It was never his plan for man to have dominion over men. Why? Because we're kings. And man there is actually the, the plural for the species. Because we are royalty. He wants us to rule as he rules. Not to be subject to each other. Next slide. And so God's original plan, I have to read it off this side, was to establish a family of spirit sons, not servants. He wanted to establish a kingdom, not a religious organization. He wanted to establish a kingdom of kings, not subjects. And he wanted to establish a commonwealth of citizens, not religious members. Establish a relationship with man. He wanted to extend his heavenly government to earth. And influence earth from heaven for, through mankind. Next slide. <clears throat> And in doing so, the ultimate king formed man of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so what happens there is, a lot of times we read through that and we don't understand. So what are the two components that exist in Adam? He's made of the earth, the creation, and he's made of that which was not created. Adam could live in two worlds. His job, how else can you communicate in the spiritual and take what the 
Heavenly Father, because God is a spirit, how can you take the spiritual and convey it to the earth if you're not spiritual? And how can you convey it to the earth if you're not natural? And so he created a being that was both. That was to, that's how you govern from the spiritual to the natural. We've said it a lot of times. We say it as a piece. How many times have you heard, our job is to take the, the spiritual things of God and make them so that people can see them? And that's a nice little saying, but if you don't know about the kingdom, it just hangs in the air and falls. Now you realize that that's not just a nicety. It's, it is our obligation. It is our purpose. It is our drive. It is who we are. It's why you were created. And there's nobody else like it. The fish can't do it. The rocks can't do it. The chickens can't do it, right? No other creature can do it. There's only one species. That's us. Next slide. Okay. So Adam had two parts, right? Spiritual and natural. So we jump to Jesus, who's often called the second Adam. And it says, after his mother Mary was betrothed, because we read this on Christmas too, uh, was betrothed to Joseph before they came, before they came together which is biblical ease for, you know, they knew each other, which is also another biblical term. They knew each other, but they didn't know each other. And so she was found with child. You all got that. You're all adults. We already sent the kids out. And so she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. An angel, and also to Joseph, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so how does that tie to Adam? Mary was what? Natural. The Holy Spirit was spiritual. Jesus, too, was spiritual just like Adam. That's why he said, I don't do anything unless I hear what? The Father say it. I, I don't say anything. I don't do anything unless I see him do it. I don't hear it. I don't say it unless I hear him say it. He walked in the spiritual and the natural. And he is the example for us so that we do the same. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but click next slide. That's why when Nicodemus comes to him, and he says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from heaven. Because nobody can do what you do unless God is with him. To which Jesus answers a very odd statement. At least to, to, to Nicodemus's, you know opening statement there. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see, oh yeah, the kingdom of God. Not religion, the kingdom of God. Next slide. And then Nicodemus, of course, confused, says, how can a man be born when he's old? Right? Can he, can he enter his mother's womb? And then it goes, well, he didn't say this, but then what if your mom's dead? And what if it's all that? You know, it just raises a bunch of questions. I really don't understand what you're talking about. And Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, which means you're natural of the earth and born of the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God wow wow now that kind of makes sense I got something to throw that on right next slide almost winding up here so, so the thing is then is we're talking about is so God says he wants man to have dominion so that the earth is in essence his, if I can use this uh, analogy, a colony, next slide, of heaven. So what are the things that occur in a colony? Well, 
Typically, a king remains, like we said, where? The king of Spain, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Did they move their throne over to Paraguay, Uruguay, Mexico, uh, any of those places, Bolivia, Colombia? No. No. They stayed in Spain. That's what they did. The king, however, in order to establish their rule in that area, will send a governor. The role of the governor is to teach the citizens of the kingdom the language of the kingdom, the behavior of the kingdom, the history of the kingdom. The governor is the most powerful person in the colony. Why? They represent the king. That's why. And so, in fact, if you want to see the king and you're from a colony, who do you have to go through to see the king? The governor. If the governor says no, you don't go. And so that's why we, we often hear the thing of, we call it the unpardonable sin, right? Where Jesus says, you can say bad stuff about me, but you can't say anything bad about the Holy Spirit. Well, why is that? Because the Holy Spirit's the governor. You get the governor mad, guess who you ain't seeing? You ain't seeing the ultimate king. You ain't even making it to Jesus to the door. That's why it's the unpardonable sin. We give it a big name, but we never explain what it is. Because we don't know about the kingdom. We don't have anything to hang it on. So he says, don't say anything bad about him. He's your buddy. Right? Okay. Uh, we'll talk about it. We're going to run out of time. We're going to talk about ambassador. Next slide, real quick. Okay, so Jesus is getting ready. This is in Acts. Jesus is getting ready to... to uh, he's dead. He's risen. Risen? 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 He's risen, and... Uh, he's on the earth, and he showed himself to people, and he's getting ready to jet out, right? And he's talking to his disciples, and he says, but now I go away to him who sent me. So who sent him? Where? The Father. That's right. Where's the Father located? In heaven. Sitting on the throne. That's why he can say, when Stephen looks up, where does he see him? If you know the story of Stephen the deacon, when he's getting, uh, before he gets uh, stoned. In Acts, I look up and I see a vision and I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Oh, I guess Jesus did go where he said he was going to go, right? I went to him who sent me. Oh, wow, I could have had a V8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father, you see me no more. Of judgment because of the ruler of the, this world is judged. Now, a lot of times we'll even talk about it. It's not our role to save the lost, is it? Whose role is it to save the lost? Huh? Well, who, who draws them? Oh, the Holy Spirit. What does that say? When he draws them, what's he doing? He's convicting them of their sin. Oh, my goodness, it's in the book. Right? And why is that? Because that's the role of the governor. The role of the governor is to say to the citizens, guess what? You're not doing this right. Guess what? Not only that, if we, if we talk in spiritual terms, you're dead. Here. Hey, hey, you're a zombie. Let me breathe on you. You need, right? Because that's what they are. They're spiritually dead. They're just natural corpses walking. Hey, 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 hey. That's the role of the governor. And to those who are righteous, what does he do? He leads us into all truth. Well, what is that truth? That truth is the history of the kingdom. Next slide. I don't want to get too far ahead. Okay. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, there we go, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own what? 
authority. Well, then whose authority is he speaking on? That's right. And why is that? Because who was he sent? Who does he represent? The king. That's why he doesn't speak on his own authority. He's the governor. Right? Now it kind of makes sense, right? And he says, he will, uh, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So everything that the Father has is mine. So whatever he declares to you is also what's coming from the Father. Wow. Wow, we got something. Hang up, next slide. Okay, so before we do that, the thing is, the role of the governor, the role of the governor is, like we said, is to teach you the language of the kingdom. How does that occur in the spiritual? What we say? What's the evidence of the Holy Ghost? Tongues. Tongues of what? Of heaven. Not your language. It's language you cannot utter, right? That's why you go in your closet. What's he doing you, to you? He's teaching you the language so that you can communicate with the heavenlies because once he comes in and he quickens you and you come to life, you now are two parts. You're natural and you're spiritual, just like Jesus who we're joint heirs with, Right? And even if it comes to a point where my little natural mind can't handle it, what does he do? He speaks for me. Because that's what the governor does. He represents me back to the king. And then it says, uh, the other part of it is he, he talks about uh, history. He teaches you the history of the kingdom. I don't know if you know it, but if you know American history or even any history of any nation that got conquered, uh, for example, in uh, Daniel, we call the book Daniel, right? Uh, Daniel, it was overcome by uh, Babylon. The country of Israel was overcome by Babylon. When Daniel went to Babylon, what happened? He had to take on the customs of Babylon. If you even read the first part of the chapter, it says they brought out, they were trying to make the wise men wise, and they brought them all these fancy stuff. And Daniel said, oh no, I'm going to eat my own stuff, right? Well, what are they eating? They're eating the stuff of the kingdom. And not only that, in uh, Babylon, he was not called Daniel. They gave him a new name. That's where we get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because that really wasn't the real name. But that was the name they were given. He was called Beersheba or something like that, right? Because when you, when you enter the kingdom and become, a, in our case, the king of the kingdom, he looks at you, he says that. I'm going to give you a new name. It doesn't matter what the world called you. It doesn't matter who you think they are or what they say about you or whatever. Mm-mm. You'll be known by the name I give you because you're a part of my kingdom. That's what he does. This whole process, a lot of times we'll say that and it's just like it hangs and then it falls. And we don't understand that, no, this is reality. And the thing about the governor is we don't really understand who the governor is. And that's what makes us weak. Because, I'll give you an example. Uh, so the U.S. used to be ruled by Britain, right? Great Britain. And so, I'm going to go back several, several years. Uh, there was, when Queen Elizabeth was Queen of England, right? Uh, she sent over Charles and Di, Right? If you all remember who they are. If you don't, then it's uh, uh, William and Kate, if that makes sense to you. And so, so she sent them over, 
they came over for two or three weeks. They toured Canada. They came down to the United States, had little parties. It was all grand and wonderful. I didn't get to go but because I wasn't invited. But all this great stuff has happened, you know, and they made speeches, and they were all so nice. They watched soccer games. They did all kinds of stuff like that. And they left. And the question is, what impact did they have on your life? None. None at all. But they were representatives of the queen, of the monarch. Yep. But they had no impact on her. Why? Because we did not submit to their authority. See, if we were still an English colony and they came, whatever they said would have been law. Right? So the Holy Spirit, he comes, we'll, we'll acknowledge him. Oh, yeah, he's a, he's a representative of Jesus. He's Jesus, I mean, uh, and the Heavenly Father. He's on earth, right? Jesus sent him. He's the helper. He's the helper. And what we miss is he is the most powerful being on this earth. That's why if you read, if you read Acts where it talks about um, Stephen, for example, Stephen is described as a man who is full of wisdom and full of the Holy Ghost. And that hit me. I thought, well, that's odd. Because typically, I, when I talk, I'll talk about Job or Noah or any of those guys, and the way they're described is they were perfect in God's sight. But they were not. Stephen wasn't described that way. He was full of the Holy Ghost. Which is the better of the two? To be full of the Holy Ghost. Because then you can not only walk in the natural, but you can see into the heavenlies. I'd even heard the story of Stephen, and I, this way where, this is what was in my head. Stephen, uh, they get mad at him, they drag him into court. If you don't know the story, they drag him into court. He, he uh, gives his witness, which makes them all mad. They gnash their teeth which I always thought was a funny way of saying they were mad. And they drag him out, and they start to stone him, and they cast their coats by uh, Saul, who became Paul. And uh, he looks into the heavens, and he sees Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And then they stone him, and he dies. And so I was reading it the other day, and that was a lie. That was all a lie. That's not what happened. Because he's actually in court... And it says his face begins to glow like an angel. And after he gives his discourse, he's, discourse, he says, Behold, I see Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And then they drag him out. And they get ready to stone him. And the thing is, he didn't die by stoning. That's not what it says. It says that they pick up their stones and get it. And it says, Stephen fell asleep. And I got to thinking, you know, what if, the way I always heard it, it was, honestly, it was kind of like this. God had pity on him. And he's getting ready to be a martyr. That's what we would use the word, right? And he let him see Jesus to get him a little extra strength to get him over the finish line. Right? I mean, honestly, that's kind of how I, I, I took it. But that's not the case. He had seen the heavenlies before because your face don't glow like an angel unless you've been there. And that only occurs if you're full of the Holy Ghost. Because the only way to the heavenlies to see what the Father's doing is through the governor. But we want to treat him like, eh, you're a good guy. If I want to do what you do, I'll do it. I listen, but I may want to argue with you. We don't really realize who he is. Ananias and Sapphira, if you know that story. They sell this pot of land. They go in and they say, we're going to give it away. We're going to give the money to the, to the, the church or whatever, to, to the, the, the uh, disciples to dis distribute. But before they get there, they get to talking. I'm going to make up a number. So we sold it for 10000 but we're going to tell them we sold it for eight. With me? Got it. We're together. So the husband goes in first. 
He's sitting there with Peter, and Peter says, hey, you said you sold this for eight. Is that true? And he goes, oh, absolutely. Peter says, you've not just lied to me. You've not lied to me. You've lied to who? The Holy Spirit. And in doing so, you've lied to God. The Father. Because this guy is that guy. And in that moment, what happened to poor old Ananias? Bink. Right, I'd fall down, but I couldn't get back up. And so they take him out. Well, a little while later, in comes his wife. Comes in, Peter says, hey, I hear you sold the land. Yeah, it's great. We'd love to give money to the church. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Really, how much was it? $8,000. Can you believe it? God is so good. Just give a little shout. God is so good. Right? And she heard the feet of those who had buried her husband were coming up. He said, the feet of them that buried your husband are coming, and guess what? You'd be going. And then the neat part beneath that is, it says, and fear fell upon the church because they realized who they were dealing with. And a lot of times I've heard sermons where it says, oh, if we could only had that same understanding, fear or whatever, they would always use the word fear. But they missed, they were looking at fear, which they said, well, it means respect. Okay, fine, whatever. But they missed the fact of why it occurred. Because the Holy Spirit was the governor of the kingdom, of the colony that was sent by the king of the kingdom. And that's why, which goes to this, my last thing, I'll leave you with this. Hopefully this works. Okay. So I'm going to have, uh, Kay, if you'll just pass this back to, towards Dale that way. Pass it back where? Just that way. Just throw it to Brad. There you go. Now pass that back to Dale a little bit. No, nope, Dale went that way. That's a good try. You're, you're kind of in line with the lesson, but that's good. Okay. All right. So we go right here. Let me pull that up. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. And then this one, I'll do easier, hopefully. Dun, dun, dun. If, uh, Tyler, since you're not at the drums when I needed you, if you'll take that in, just kind of stretch it to the sound booth. Okay. And I'll just use this piece here. Okay. So what we have are two separate paths. And, uh, Chancellor, if you'll come up. He's going to be my little demo guy here. And what you'll notice, uh, you can pull that tight there, Dale. Good. You got it tight there, Anthony? Ding, ding. Actually, at this point right here, they're at the same spot. But if I make a little bit of a change, like this in angle, the further I go down, the greater the change is going to be. A small change at the beginning over time can create a large change in the future. Whether that's good or whether that's bad or however we want to view that. And so, uh, I'm going to lasso this, see if this holds. Hey, what do you know? Dinga, dinga, dinga. And to kind of give an example of that, oh, it worked. Okay, you need to go underneath. There you go. He's going to follow this line. Oh, wait, together, as I follow this line. So time's going to pass, and what you'll notice is, as we go along, as we go along, the distance between us, yeah, his, wait, wait, his road, yeah, it gets wider. And, now, my way is straight and narrow. It's not too hard. I'm really not sweating, right? I mean, well, I'm a little fat. Other than that, I'm not sweating. Right? Him, however, oh my goodness, he's got to climb over people. He's got to get around people. Brad's in his way. I mean, it's a big guy. What do you do? And it's Brad and his dad. He had to go between them. It's like between two mountains. Right? <laughs> had to go up there. He had to climb over seats. He doesn't know what to do. And so that way is actually a lot harder. But I just keep going and we keep going. Okay, right there. Sounds good. And so the, 
the thing is that the further we went down the path, like you said, the further distance, also the path, and we're saying the red is the true path, right? That this true path was easier, it was straight, it was narrow. I didn't have to go through all that drama, I didn't have to go through all that stuff. And the, what came to me as I was thinking about that was this. A lot of times, we'll get information that's a piece, and we'll hang to it. And that small change causes us to deviate. And the thing is, yes, we may end up over there against the wall, uh, alone, out of rope, out of road. But the neat thing is, our Savior doesn't leave us there. It doesn't matter how wide the gap. It doesn't matter what you may have been taught. Once you become His, He gives you a new name and you enter a new kingdom. And the other thing about entering a new kingdom is you get a new history. The history you're taught is not your own. Where you came from, whatever happened to you, whatever it was, means absolutely nothing. Because now you have entered into the history of the kingdom, the kingdom of glory. And that glory and that history belongs to you. Wow. And so, the, so what it time to was this, and, and uh, I hope this I understand what I'm doing here, is he runs out of road, but because Jesus loves us, because the, the root isn't around just establishing a kingdom, the question falls back to why does he want us to be a part of this kingdom? Because he couldn't make us like the fish, he couldn't make us robots. It's tied up in one word. It's the one word that, that, that flows through all bit of scripture, and that is the word love. We talk about he died on the cross, right? He did all these things. He even has covenant with us, right? He does all that. But why does he have covenant? Well, it's found in John 3.16. For God so loved. And not only that, but which this is one he showed me a while back was, even while I was yet a sinner, this has nothing to do with me. He died for my sin. And so, even when I've run out of road, I run into a man I didn't know, and he tells me that I was not alone. And he picks me up, and he turns me around, and he sets my feet on solid ground. I thank what? Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God, right? Because he, uh, what's the rest of it? It's actually, I just lost it. He changed my name, right? Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. And then the chorus goes to this. If you'll slide under here. Because hell lost another one. And I am free. Go ahead. I am free. I am free. Who's free? Hell lost another one. Who's free? I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. And I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. Who's free? Because he picked me up. And he turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. Let's give him 30 seconds of magnificent praise. I'll take that. And then he leads us to where we only have the one path. And for that we sing, glory to his name, glory to his name. There at the cross was the blood applied, and I sing glory to his name. Oh, it's
gets glory to his name. Glory to his holy name. There to my heart was the blood applied. And I sing glory to his name. And we end with this song as Sean begins to lead us. Just worship with us. You will 
So the, if you could flip back to the uh, picture of the, that had the explorers and the flags for just one second. So our role is to extend the kingdom of God. And you, the question is sometimes, how do we how do, we do that? And uh, I was talking with somebody this week, uh, it was this, about this past week when we had, for example, the revival. And during the revival, uh, the Holy Spirit laid on their hearts to speak to those uh, where they worked around uh, about coming to the revival. And the uh, and as we we're talking about it, what what kind of mind was was this analogy of how uh, a lot of times we say that He's with us, right? And when we go, He goes with us. We talk about that all the time. But the problem is we go and then we leave and we leave there's no uh, evidence that we were there. And so in reality you have not conquered any ground. You've invaded but then you're repulsed or you left or whatever it is like the U.S. did. You know, we just leave. But you conquered nothing. But, but what this person had done by following the Holy Spirit I view as, just like these explorers, they planted a flag. Did those people enjoy it? One of them said, you'll never catch me in church. Doesn't matter. I am claiming this land for the kingdom of heaven. And every day, I'm going to claim this land. And so... So your, the challenge I give you, I guess, the takeaway is a couple. One, begin to recognize who the Holy Spirit really is. See him as the governor, not just as this, eh, I'm in a hole, I'll call the helper. Well, because as the governor, he'll actually keep you out of the hole. And the other is, begin to stake the claim for the land to expand the kingdom. Once again, you say, well, how many of those people came? Well, maybe none of them. But whose job is it to woo them? It's not hers. It's the governor's. But by stepping forth and planting the flag, she now has said, you have control over this land. I am claiming this land for you. And that gives the governor the authority to enter to the area. And so even as we pray, I guess the last thing would be this. God, and this goes back to what he said in the revival, God wants to use you. Why? Because he has put you as the authority on the earth. He is waiting on you, he even says this, to ask him, right? Right? I mean, we talk about asking you will receive, seeking you will find, knock it shall be open. He is waiting on you because he has given you the authority on the earth, but you don't have the power. Where's the power? With the Father. And so then we enter into, we go through the Holy of Holies into the heavenlies, right? And we're with the Father and we make our petition and the Father says, oh yeah, I'll do that for you. You got sick friends, you got loved ones that are lost, you got whatever, it doesn't matter. I will begin to move on your behalf. But because we don't access him, then what happens normally is we will have a prayer line or we'll go up and this is our prayer for people, just to be blunt. 
Lord, if it's your will, make them better. Lord, if you feel like it today, make them better. That's funny. Jesus didn't pray that way. He didn't say to Lazarus, Hey, Lazarus, if you're not doing something, come on out. Lazarus, you got a 50-50. I'm going to say something. Maybe you'll come out. Maybe you won't. He didn't do that. Why? Because when he prayed for Lazarus, he always said, Jesus said he did two things. First, he said he did one thing. That was the will of the Father. What's that made up of? What I hear the Father say, I say. And what I see the Father do, I do. Even before he went to see Lazarus, he had already seen him raised from the dead because he had seen the Father do the work. Because he would go off and make petition, right? That's what we call prayer. Into the heavenlies. That's what he did. That was his habit. In fact, it's the only thing, and I'm going to cut off of this, it's the only thing that the disciples asked Jesus, how do you do it? They didn't ask him how you cast out demons. They didn't ask him how you heal the sick. They didn't ask him how you do those things. They said, teach us one thing, how to pray. And in their prayer, it was simple. Our Father, the source from which we come, who rests in the heavens, who has all power, right? Give me today my daily bread. Because I'm not worried about tomorrow, because why? Because the king owns the tomorrow. I only need to ask him for today. And the last thing of that is, I think the biggest obstacle he actually tells us is unforgiveness. Help me to forgive those, right, who trespass against me. If we're not doing that, he even tells us the parable, right? It goes so far as he makes a parable up about the servant who, who was forgiven millions of dollars, lack of a better term, and yet didn't forgive this other guy. And his unforgiveness, he was cast back into the torment. He forgave us so much. All he wants us to do is forgive people. You do that, you can ascend to the governor. The governor can lead you to the Father, right? And then whatever you ask and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever, right? It's in heaven, is loose on earth, is be loosed in heaven. Why? We don't control heaven. But we are in alignment with the Father. And we don't, just like Jesus then, we will not be ashamed to say, yes, the Father lives in me. I am a son of my Father. That's your challenge. Thank you. You may go. Oh, we do have, just a reminder, we do have the uh, dinner next door. So go eat, support, as Stephen said, all those good things. Sorry about that. Thank you all. Huh? Oh, bless the food. Yes, Stephen, go ahead, please.